Welcome everyone to Q&A with PB. I am Pastor Benner here at Bishop Cummins Reformed Episcopal Church in Catonsville, Maryland. I realize that so many of us have questions about life, about God, which we wish we could ask Him. We see things in our world and in our lives that raise hard questions. And I want to try to answer some of these difficult questions and pressing issues during Q&A with Pastor Benner. Today we're on Facebook Live. After we're done today's Q&A session, you'll be able to access this on Facebook. Thanks for tuning in today, and I hope you find that I may be answering a question you have always wanted answered. First question comes from somebody who said this about the works of C.S. Lewis, that they have been profoundly inspirational to him especially his books on the problem of pain and the great divorce. So he asked the question, are there any special cautionary notes about elevating Lewis too highly? I want to broaden it beyond just C.S. Lewis and say that any author that you very much appreciate and respect, no matter who they are, you have to first keep first and foremost the unique authority of Holy Scripture as being the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And because the Bible is the Word of God, we give it a special and one-of-kind unique allegiance, devotion, and commitment that we have because it is the Word of God. And we ought not to give to any human author, leader, or per person that kind of allegiance and devotion. The temptation comes when you really like a certain author, leader, whether a leader in the church, the business world, or politics, or even a sports hero, that we start to unconsciously get snagged into a type of hero worship. We start defending them regardless of the issue because they're one of us. They're part of our team and our tribe. And we can start getting engaged in blind loyalty to them. So that's what I'm discouraging uh, the questioner from doing. I have behind me in my bookcase a number of commentaries on the Bible. And I consult them when facing a difficult passage that I'm going to teach or preach on. And so as I read through them, I weigh pros and cons for each viewpoint, I try to ascertain what level of importance that this issue that I'm addressing has. It's not always incumbent upon me that I make up my mind which viewpoint is correct and which ones I disagree with or which ones I have to sit loose on. But the point I am making is that Scripture has infallible authority. And while Bible commentaries can be helpful and useful as an aid to trying to understand the proper interpretation of a biblical text. Still, a commentary or a group of people within a theological viewpoint do not have inherent absolute authority. If someone is proposing an interpretation of Scripture that no one else has proposed in the first 2,000 years of church history, I think a red flag should go up. Now getting back to C.S. Lewis, he is one of my more favorite authors. I won't say he is my most favorite, but I certainly like him. But I, don't, I do disagree with him on some issues, and I'll give you an example. C.S. Lewis held to purgatory in the afterlife. Purgatory is a teaching that besides heaven and hell, there's this third category of purgatory. Roman Catholics, Orthodox Christians, and other Christian bodies hold to this other state within the afterlife. Those who hold to purgatory believe all those in purgatory will eventually get to heaven, but they left this life not sufficiently sanctified in their walk with the Lord, and they believe God will use the time in purgatory to purge them, to clean them up until they are ready for heaven. I certainly don't agree with Lewis on that, and I take issue with him on that viewpoint. 
But having said that, I do respect his writings and find him to be a helpful Christian author. I especially like his books, The Screwtape Letters, Mere Christianity, and A Grief Observed. Another question came up, how do we engage with Christians who disagree with us at various levels of theology? How do we strike a good balance between maintaining important doctrinal distinctives without insisting on them as dogma? I do make a distinction between those teachings and doctrines which are foundational to the Christian faith and those teachings which are non-essential to one's salvation and ones which Christians can disagree about. Let me give a few examples of the cardinal teachings of Christianity. Two examples of the cardinal Christians uh, teachings of Christianity are the teachings of the Holy Trinity and the Incarnation of Christ. Before I go any further, let me define what I just meant by the Trinity and the Incarnation of Christ. The teaching of the Holy Trinity says that there is one God, but within the one God there eternally exists three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I know it sounds hard to fit that together logically, but there's one God who eternally exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So Christians don't believe in three gods, nor do they believe in one God in one person, but one God eternally existing in three persons. The other terminology I brought up was the incarnation of Christ. And that simply means that Jesus Christ is fully God, and at a certain point he became fully man when he was born of the Virgin Mary. And so Jesus Christ from all eternity was fully God, but when he became, when he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, he became man. And so Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. These two teachings of the Christian faith are cardinal, they're foundational. If you don't believe these two teachings, you cannot say in good conscience and with any credibility from Scripture that you're a Christian. The Christians have always held to the Holy Trinity and the Incarnation of Christ. In regard to the Incarnation of Christ, John 1, verses 1, 14, and verse 17 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. These are foundational truths of the Christian faith where Christians have based this teaching on Holy Scripture. There are other issues which Christians disagree about and have differing practices concerning which are not essential. Christians have come to different conclusions in regard to do we baptize infants or do we baptize only professing Christians. We also have differences about the spiritual gifts, specifically of the supernatural gifts of speaking in tongues still in vogue today. What about the gifts of healing, the extraordinary offices of apostles and prophets? In regard to these issues, it's important to recognize that Christians can disagree with other Christians about this issue, these issues, but that doesn't mean that if you come to an opposite conclusion that you're either more or less a Christian because of it. Some issues which are non-essential have varying degrees of importance. The examples of non-essential issues I have mentioned do have some importance, and they have influence, especially on the life of a local church. We do, we do need to have a charitable judgment about these matters. There has been a good saying in circulation among Christians for quite some time, which is this, which I find helpful. helpful. In essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity. 
This has often been attributed to Augustine, although I cannot find it in his writings, but it also was popularized by a German theologian of the early 17th century who's pretty much not well known, and his name is Rupertus Meldinius. The phrase occurs in a tract he wrote on Christian unity around 1627, and that was during the Thirty Years' War in Europe, a bloody time in European history in which religious tensions played a significant role. Uh, the war was fought between Catholics and Lutherans and other bodies of Christian believers. The saying has found a great uh, acceptance among sub subsequent writers such as Richard Baxter, who was the Puritan theologian, and it's also a model of various Christian denominations today. To me, it strikes the right balance that we need to strike in being faithful to the essentials of the Christian faith and to hold those non-essentials in a less dogmatic way, and in all things to work with charity towards all people. Our Lord, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul Ratter says in Ephesians 14, 4, verse 15, Ephesians 4, 15, speaking the truth in love. So we need to keep that in mind as we consider these issues. In case you're just joining us, this is Q&A with PB, and I'm attempting to share some of life's hardest questions and come up with answers from Holy Scripture. You'll be able to submit your questions after we go offline today in case you weren't, you weren't able to join us. Brings me to my next question is, how true is the love and respect formula found in Ephesians 5, the husband should love his wife with a Christ-like and sacrificial love while the wife owes her husband respect? Does, this, does respect always equal obedience? What are the limits of this? Well, this question comes from a passage from Paul's epistle in Ephesians 5, verses 22, 25, and 33, which says this, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. However, let each of you Love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The paradigm and example that Paul has set up here is com comparing marriage to the relationship between Christ and his church, where Christ is the husband and the church is the bride of Christ. Any and all husbands don't measure up to the Lord Jesus Christ. The difficulty is given that any husband is also a sinner and can misuse his God-given role as a leader within the marriage. Are there any safeguards or qualifiers which limit the extent of a wife? As you do your weekly shopping, because we're financially strapped, she is not to follow his counsel because it goes against the commandment, you shall not steal. There may be other areas of uh, tension points between a husband's demands on his wife. I think one of them is, is the counsel reasonable. If he gives his counsel to his wife, that uh, let's say they have two teenage boys and he wants the teenage boys up in their room uh, at by 8 o'clock each night so they can have quality time together. I think that's probably not reasonable as a request. So I think not only do we have to pay attention to if anything contradicts God's law, but also the uh, qualifier that is the request he is making reasonable. 
Another question that someone brought up, and this is in regard to the creed, a line of the creed, a person brought up the question, what do you as a Protestant mean when you say we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church? Is there a ju scriptural justification for saying we believe in the Catholic Church? It's important to say what do we mean by the Catholic Church? When I profess each Sunday I believe in the Catholic Church, I don't mean the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic means universal. So I interpret the creed to mean that the Catholic Church consists of all those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That Jesus is fully God, fully man, and he is the one who came and died on the cross for our sins. While the word Catholic does not appear in the Bible, the concept of the church being Catholic and worldwide, including all those who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, is a scriptural one. Galatians 3, 26-29 says this, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. In addition, the Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 3.14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. The Catholic Church then includes all those Christians and all churches which confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It includes Christians from all regions of the world and from all times. To this extent, the Church includes both those believers here on earth and the believers in heaven. One last question I want to cover during our time is also related to a clause in the creed, and that is, what do we mean when we say in the Apostles' Creed that Christ descended into hell, and where do we back that up from Scripture? It's important to realize at the outset that this clause in the creed has many interpretations. Some of those viewpoints of what that clause means I don't agree with. One interpretation I don't agree with says that after Christ died, he appeared to the place of the dead and offered people who lived before he came to earth another chance to believe on him. I don't agree with that because scripture says in Hebrews 9:27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. People get thousands of chances to believe in Christ once, but once a person dies, their eternal destiny is sealed. Once a person dies, there is no more chance to repent and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. But going back to the creed, the Latin in the creed actually should be understood that Christ descended to the place of the dead. And while it is translated often, he descended into hell, I prefer the understanding that Christ went to the place of the dead. And so I would understand this clause of the creed to mean mainly and only that Christ truly died. So he died, he buried, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And I don't think you have to pinpoint that he went to the place of the dead, either righteous or unrighteous. But it means specifically that Christ truly died. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to Q&A with P. Bay. I am Pastor Benner, coming to you as pastor of Bishop Cummins Reformed Episcopal Church here in Catonsville, Maryland. And I pray that God will bless you in the coming weeks so that all we can all see who God is and his love for us as we face these difficult questions of life together. 
For now, we're not going to be doing Facebook Live for either November or December. Until we see each other again, God bless you.